In this video, I'm going to be talking to you about orbital mechanics and lots of important concepts that we need to know. I like this one here from XKCD, <laughs> how well I understand orbital mechanics. Took high school physics, got physics degree, actual job at NASA, and it's a game called Kerbal Space Program. I've played that lots as well. It's so much fun, and you really can learn a lot, for example, about Hohmann transfers, for example, how orbits really work. It's actually amazing, and you have lots of fun doing it. Okay, let's talk about how orbits actually work. The idea behind it is really that you just need to be, in order to orbit, um, you can think about this, that it's almost like throwing an object. That's what I was, I was trying to, to use as an example here. So let's say I'm here and I throw an object. I mean, we're going to have this crazy weird view where I'm really, really big compared to the planet. Uh, so something like this right here, for example, like let's say I throw an object and it might just land on the ground like that. You know, if I just throw it, it just goes down. That's because, of course, gravity is always acting on this object. Even if I give it a forward velocity, it still falls down with gravity. Now, if I throw it faster, but not fast enough, so I mean, maybe it sort of it follows the surface for a little while, but it still will sort of fall. But can you see that if I throw it at just the right speed, I throw it, and it's always trying to fall down, but it's like the Earth just keeps getting out of the way. So it's a little bit... Uh, crazy to think about, but that's actually really how an orbit can be seen. So you can see it as, I'm just bad at drawing here, but to get the idea here that you throw the object and the Earth is always attracting it. So it's still always this gravitational force going down. But what happens is, of course, it's like the Earth is falling away from it at just the right speed. We're just, it's always falling. So this is actually how orbits really work. So in terms of orbital energy, let's consider a situation where we have a planet that's uh, got a satellite in orbit around it. For example, on the planet has a mass capital M, satellite has a mass lowercase m, and it's got an orbital radius r. So that means it's going around in this circle here. Now, um, we're going to attempt then to look at kinetic potential and total energy in this orbit. Keep in mind then, if we want to know energies, and this is the radius right here, this right here is going to be the radius of the planet. So we're not going to consider anything here. This is going to be blank. So it's really important to consider that. The actual planet itself will have its own radius. Maybe I'll call the planet radius, you know, capital R. Well, then this one right here will be some sort of, you know, planet radius there. Okay, so we're going to ignore that. Now, what happens to the kinetic energy? Hopefully you remember that equation. It goes EK equals half mv squared. Now, it turns out, um, as orbital radius gets larger, uh, the speed gets smaller. We're going to see that later. I'm going to show the derivation of that, but really, you have to trust me for now. As r gets bigger, maybe I'll put it down here. So as r gets bigger, speed gets smaller. So because of that, then, if we looked at something like this right here, uh, we could graph something like this right here. So for example, something like this. It's not perfect, but I hope you get the idea here. This right here is something where the kinetic energy, I'll call it EK here, goes something like this. Now, the potential energy, we have seen that one before as well. So that one goes like this. It goes minus G M1 M2 over R. I prefer this version EP equals just minus G capital M lowercase m over R. I think that version is a little bit nicer for me to think about. And if you look at this one then, remember uh, this energy then is going to be a proportional to 1 over r. Now, 1 over r graph would go like this, but it's negative, so it goes down below. Now, it's not the same height as this. It turns out this one is more negative. So I don't know if that makes any sense here, but this one here, for example, is actually even further down than the ek1 is up, because this is the potential energy here. It's negative. Now, remember what happens with uh, total energy Oops, I'm just trying to get a nice E here. So the total energy, uh, remember what that is. Total energy is just E P plus E K. So the total energy is just the kinetic plus the potential. So that means then that the total energy will be, let's just put them together then, it's going to be half mv squared well, plus a negative gmm over r squared. Like that. Oh, sorry, not r squared, just r. This here is the equation we have for this. So we've got these three equations, and right? we've got this one, and this one, and this one. And what I think is interesting to look at is let's look at what the graph would be then for the total energy. Where is it going? This one, it's basically this height, you know, minus this height. So it turns out you'll be somewhere over here. And so it turns out this total energy graph will go something like this. This is really important that you know about this right here. So it looks like the total energy is indeed negative, and that's actually all right. That's because of how we've defined the potential energy. So this is your 
energies graph. That's really important to know. Now for the orbital speed of an object, for example, this satellite, remember it's going around this planet of mass capital M here. Well, we can look at this as well. We've done this derivation in pieces before, but I want to fully do it. The gravitational force acting on this thing, we're going to use Newton's universal law of gravitation minus gmm over r squared, even though um, it looks like minus, uh, so it looks like gm1 m2 over r squared in your data booklet, but we're going to keep this one. And then we have the centripetal force, where that's going to be m times v squared over r. v squared over r is the centripetal acceleration, so m times that gives you the force. And we're going to set, we're going to set uh, fg equals fc. So we're going to do that there, and what do we get? Let's see, we get gmm over r squared equals uh, mv squared over r. And what happens then? We've got, oops, I just want to make sure my square didn't look too crazy. I just thought it looked a little bit too big there. Um, what cancels out? The m's do, at least the lowercase m's do. And I can move this r squared over here, and I can, uh, yeah, I'll do that actually. So that will give me, let's see, g m equals, and my r squared over to the right right here, it'll be, end up on the top here, r squared over r just gives me an r, like a single r on the top. Um, okay, and if I want to get v squared by itself then, I can then say, well, g m over r equals v squared. So do you notice then, because I have that, I can say that the v, the speed of this object then, is just going to be the square root, technically plus or minus, but we're going to only consider the positive part. So I can say then it's just the square root of g m over r. This is our equation, turns out, for the orbital speed. And we've just derived it. Maybe I'll actually uh, leave a little bit more space. I'll write it like this right here because this is actually an equation we're going to need. So V and it goes orbital. And this is an equation that you might be asked to derive, but it's actually an equation you get on your data booklet, so that's good. So the orbital speed is related to the mass of the object you're orbiting, not the mass of the satellite, though, notice, and it's also related to the orbital radius. And do you notice then, notice what happens here. As r goes up, notice that the v goes down, the orbital speed goes down. Or conversely, you can also have that r goes down, v goes up. Seems a little bit strange, so that means that the farther away it goes, the slower it travels. But maybe that makes sense if you saw those videos I was showing you before with uh, Kepler's law, for example. But there we go, so this right here, at least is how orbital speed works. So what does this mean? Well, let's take a look maybe at the total energy. Let's look at this. The total energy, remember, we just learned was half mv squared, that's the kinetic energy, plus the potential energy, which is minus gm m over r. Now, what we're saying then is it's the minimum speed you need to reach r equals uh, infinity. And the key thing is going to be this. This right here is the key part, is we're going to have uh, r equals infinity, that's true. And if you put r equals infinity here, divide by infinity, it pretty much gives you zero. And remember, as uh, r gets bigger, v gets smaller. So does it make sense then that what this means is that et equals zero? This is the key sort of piece we need to put this all together. So because of that, then we can set et equals zero. That's the key to doing this derivation, so to speak. So we can say that et equals zero. So that means then that 0 equals 1 half mv squared minus g m m over r. That means I can move this negative term, I can move it to the left to make it positive. So that means I can say that g m m over r, that equals half mv squared. Let's keep going then. Uh, maybe I'll put the 2 over to the other side. Oh, I can actually cancel out the little m's. Those will cancel out. So then I end up with, let's see, I've got gm over r, all that times 2. Okay, so I'll put that in right here. So I've got 2 times gm over r, that equals v squared. Does it make sense on that v, and we're going to call it escape? The escape speed then of an object is going to be just, well, it's going to be 2 gm over r square rooted. And this is another equation you get on your data booklet, but I'm showing you how to derive it because you might be asked for that. And what I think is maybe a fun fact, I don't know if you'll find it fun, but I think it is, is that, well, black holes, I, this is not, by the way, in the syllabus. You don't need to know this necessarily. But I think it's just interesting, okay? So I'll say maybe not needed, but you might want to know about this just because it's interesting to me at least. Um, 
There's something called black holes, if you've ever heard of those. There's something called a Schwarzschild radius, or the event horizon. We often call it R. S, like a radius with a little S for Schwarzschild. This is basically the distance uh, beyond which you, uh, sorry, within which you can't escape. So even if you're in a spaceship, no matter how fast it goes, if you're within that, the escape speed is actually the speed of light, which means you couldn't possibly leave. So what do we do there? We just set, watch this, we just set uh, a V escape. We just set that to be um, C. So we're going to say that C equals, and maybe I'll actually square both sides. I'll, I'll put it back to where we had it over here. So I'll say that C squared equals 2GM over this Schwarzschild radius. Therefore, you can just get the radius on the other side. So you can say, ah, the radius then is equal to, let's see, it's going to be 2GM over C squared. Turns out this is the Schwarzschild radius derivation for a black hole. Isn't that cool? So you can actually figure out then, hey, what's your Schwarzschild radius? You'll see that your mass is very, very small. So that means your Schwarzschild radius is very small. Good news, you're not going to turn into a black hole anytime soon unless we can collapse you down to a very, very small radius. So what happens to real orbits when there's the atmosphere? Because if you're if you're fairly low in an orbit, the atmosphere is still, you know, there's still some air and it's going to, I mean, there's not lots. And it's it's not like it stops at one line or anything. It's this, you know, a very gradual decrease in you know atmosphere in density of the air or the atmosphere that there is so for example um you know as you're in low earth orbit there is enough to where it really is going to experience like the, it's like a, a satellite for example the international space station it experiences this viscous drag force that's caused by the atmosphere it's also the reason why when objects re-enter uh, when airplanes or you know spaceships re-enter earth's atmosphere they get so hot and that's because of this viscous drag force is actually quite large then. In this case, though, if you're just trying to be in a happy orbit, if you're in a fairly low orbit, this is going to have an effect on you. The total energy of the orbit will go down. So this loss uh, you know, of energy, it makes the radius smaller. It should hopefully make sense. Your radius then gets smaller. Now let's remind ourselves what the equation is for this. It goes ET, remember, equals 1 half mv squared minus gm m over r. So what does that really do? It seems a little bit weird, but what's going to happen then is as r then gets smaller, they're, div they're taking a number divided by a smaller number, makes it bigger, but it's a bigger negative. So that has a net effect of decreasing this. But remember also that we learned though that if r gets smaller though, v gets larger. So what's really weird about it, it seems a bit counterintuitive, but counterintuitively, uh, counterintuitively this means that the orbital speed increases. Now, why is that? Well, that's because, remember, we just learned before that the V orbital, the orbital speed, let me just remind you, remember, it goes um, G M over R and it's square rooted. So what that means is if this number right here gets smaller, this has to get bigger. Let me write it down. If ET then goes down, that means R goes down, but that means V goes up. So this is actually really important here. And by contrast, by the way, of course, we can do the opposite, right? If ET goes up, well, that's because the radius, the orbital radius goes up, but that means the orbital speed actually goes down. Now, this should make some sense of still, because when you think about um, Kepler's laws, for example, that as you're further out in an orbit, you actually orbit kind of, you orbit slower. This is a little bit weird, right? Because you'd think, hey, if the radius goes down, shouldn't I be slowing down? But as far as your orbital speed goes, no, no, your orbital speed actually goes up, right? Because, you know, you go faster the closer you are to an object. Now, what happens with the energies here? As the total energy goes down and the radius goes down, what happens? Well, we know that the kinetic energy then will go up, and we know that the potential energy will technically go down. Right, because it becomes a larger negative number. And this, the converse is true here. So EK here goes down because EP here goes up. There we go. So that might not seem super obvious. I just want you to remember though, if your orbital radius goes down, your speed actually increases. That's the key thing I think I want you to know.